I think that there were vulnerabilities that existed under the system. First of all, the financial gaps between entities is clear. The rich, the poor, those who have good income statements and good balance sheets and those has been a defining characteristics. Some of those will be broken and it has enormous political consequences. Uh, the left and the right will be, I think, in greater conflict. And so that issue has also been connected to the changes in money and credit. In other words, before that, uh, interest rates hit zero and there was not classic monetary policy. And also when there was QE, it didn't pass through to those who needed the money the most. And we're now we're in a new era in which there is going to be government borrowing money and directing that money more than the normal capital markets and central banks buying money. And that is going to have a profound impact on the value of money, probably reserve currencies and so on. And then related to that is it's a defining uh, moment in terms of the strong and the weak, which, uh, for example, China has come out of this very well, and it's going to change the nature of capital flows, I think. So I think that it'll have political and wealth implications that will be very important and will be clarified over the next, I think, two years. I think that this is a good summary. I think uh, when I look at history, I've studied the rise and decline of reserve currencies over the last 500 years. And um, this is a moment of a change in the world order, very similar to that which happened prior to World War I, prior to World War II, an analogous period. There's large wealth gaps and income gaps and opportunity gaps that exist. There's no time that has been this large since the 1930s. At the same time, monetary policy and debt policies in which when you have a zero interest rate, there needs to be the expansion of debt and that monetization of debt. Last time that happened like this to this grade was 1930 to 45 period. And the rising power of China challenging an existing power in its competitions. The last time that existed was in the 1930s to 45 period. There are struggles, fights over wealth and political power within countries and then between countries, that confrontation, that issue about how to deal with that, whether it's in a peaceful way or in a confrontational way within countries, like our political divide and our social divide that exists in the United States and in many countries, or between countries, such as the conflicts that exist between the United States world order and the Chinese rise in which there's a trade war, a technology war, a geopolitical war, and even a capital war now, and then there's military conflict. We, I believe, are coming into a more challenging environment because of the nature of how this happens over and over again through history in these cycles. So I think that this is a defining moment of how we're going to be with each other internally within countries and externally, but we're still going to have to face the problems of how do you create money and credit and how do you get it into the hands of those people who need it most. So I think that the summary is completely right and I hope that we follow that better direction. I'd like to emphasize the portfolio because I think that's probably most relevant to other people. There's a period of, I think, great uncertainty and great risk. And so I think there are three words, diversification, liquidity, and then differentiation. We want to make sure that our investors are not just concentrated in some of the traditional markets. So diversification of how to do that well can reduce risk without reducing opportunity. And that means currency diversification, including the reserve currencies, how much exposure is to the reserve currencies, but it means currency diversification, asset class diversification, country diversification, and that should be the starting point of portfolios. In terms of liquidity, it allows you the flexibility to change as circumstances change. And differentiation is the most important consideration. Now, there are two different worlds. There are worlds that will be orderly and will prosper in this kind of an environment, and you could see it. And that differentiation versus other worlds and markets related to that 
that will be bankrupt and disorderly. That kind of differentiation is important. As far as the business goes, we have, you know, the different location considerations and long relationships that we're building on. You could see it. It's reflected in the income statements and balance sheet. Every individual, every company, every country, how well they are depends on how much their income is relative to their expenses and how much their assets are relative to their liabilities. So you can see radical differences in the financial consequences of that. Second, the proximity to those who are printing and distributing money. Are you a recipient of that? For example, a lot of the third world is not a recipient of that and is not in good financial situations. And then there is order, political and also social order. So it, when you could see it differentiated in the countries that are controlling the virus and behaving orderly and well together. So you could see those differentiations reflected in the market's behavior. And you can also see it reflected in the political and social conditions. You know, when we look at interest rate market, we look at the earnings yield. When we look at stocks and we look at PEs, they're basically yields. And the capacity of central banks to print money and buy financial assets has essentially let the bond market to go to multiples that are somewhere between 100 times. You know, you put a dollar out and you'll get your money back in 100 years. So it's as a 100 time multiple. You have to compare stock multiples to bond multiples. And so the capacity of central banks to put liquidity into the system and to have that liquidity go to produce high multiples is very uh, real. It also changes the economics of borrowing. In other words, if you can find something that makes anything more than a zero, you're going to make money. So that encourages the leveraging and it changes. So the financial flows that we're seeing, the market behavior is reflective of that. In my opinion, don't own bonds and don't own cash because they're producing a lot of debt and producing a lot of money to fund it. And so that's changing the nature of capital flows. It's also changing how those flows go to China in terms of the comparison of that market, particularly as it opens up. So I think it's behaving sensibly, but don't use old multiples as reflections of the limitations of what's expensive. Let me just fast forward on the financial part of that. The cycle is really that debt and credit creates buying power. And so it's a short term stimulative and it's a longer term depressant because you have to pay it back. And so every time an economy gets weaker and so they jab it with credit and it pumps it up and then but it accumulates this debt. So it rises and they keep doing that until it becomes more and more difficult. So as you get down to something like a zero interest rate, it becomes more difficult. And also the pile of that debt is also the pile of somebody's assets. They own the bonds. They own the financial assets and all of those financial assets are claims on real stuff, real goods and services. So when we think about money or storeholds of wealth and you say, where is your wealth? We tend to define it as those financial assets, but those financial assets have no purpose other than to sell them to get the goods and services. And when the pile becomes very big and the incentives for not holding that are no longer there, you have a problem, okay? Because like it's, it's gone through history. You have those financial assets want to go to get the tangible assets. In the old days, that would be go get the gold or something. But when you go there, there's too many claims to, for, to get it. And then you have that problem and inevitably there's the printing of money. So we can think of the financial system. We'll start there before we get to the wealth gap and the other thing. You can basically see that the cycle that we're in, the new world order, began in 1945 at the end of World War II. And that is when the United States won the war. These cycles happen this way. There's a conflict, there's a winner, and there's new rules of the game, and there's a new reserve currency, and that's the dollar. And the dollar was connected to gold. And it wasn't really, nobody thought of it as having any value. It was like checks in a checkbook, and the money was the gold, 
And so the little pieces of paper would go get you the gold. And that system then resulted in us spending. We had the privilege of the reserve currency that people want to lend to us. We would spend more than we earned. And those who got these dollars turned those dollars in to get their gold. And the gold stocks went down. And then in 1971, I remember it well because I was clerking on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, Nixon says to the country or says to the world in his very polite and diplomatic way that you're not going to get the gold anymore. And so there was the devaluation and the printing of money, and we had the 70s and so on. So we're in a situation that's like that. We have the decline in, you know, the decline in real rates, the pushing of a lot of liquidity around, out because there's not enough money, not enough hard money, but everybody needs more money. So uh, we need that more money. So money is credit. You can make it up. So the government creates a lot of credit and the central bank prints a lot of money and there's not much incentive to hold this money. Think about cash. If you hold cash, you get no interest rate, but there's an inflation rate and then you have taxes and things. And if you think about bonds, there's not much incentive there, you know, negative in some places. And so now we have a supply demand problem, okay? Because as you look at the budgets and you look ahead, we know we're going to need a lot more money, a lot more debt. And this is all the cycle. You need the more money, you have to print that. You need more money, so taxes go up and that produces the dynamic. Now I can keep going on about what happens in that dynamic. It may be capital controls. You start to go to things where that money wants to go someplace and it goes to almost anything else. Particularly at all that time, I learned in 71, uh, painfully learned in 71, that it causes uh, like stocks to go up. It causes everything. We can deal with the mechanics of the stocks, gold, Bitcoin, real estate, uh, everything to go up because it's really going down in dollars. First of all, there are two types of inflation. There's the supply demand inflation when demand is strong enough and it presses up against capacity like you don't have enough labor, unemployment rates are low and capacity is low and then prices go up and there's that kind of inflation. And then there's a monetary inflation uh, which comes from the supply of debt being too much so that they produce more of the money and the holders of those financial assets, particularly bonds, because bonds is just a promise to receive money that the central bank can print, the holders of that then go into those other things. And then what happens is then you just have to follow the money. So you see who gets the money. And then when they get the money, you see what they do with that money. So let's say if you change who gets the money now, because we're going to change that, taxes will change that, other things will change that. That goes then to those other people. So the inflation, the big inflations, the ones that are really most important are not the ones of the supply and the demand. They are the ones like that which followed 1971, my example. Okay, there's not enough money. You put it down, uh, you devalue, in other words, you sever the link. And then with that, then there's a monetary inflation. You go into those other things and then you, know, you have that. So the risk, are, let's say our, there's two risks. We will have a hell of a lot of demand because we put all that money in. Cash is all over the place. And it, even investments, you know, all the investments go up because of so much cash and how do you find a good investment? But in also there's so much money and it'll change the amount that is in the hands of individuals and so on. And so if now it's in cash and that'll move on because cash is trash. I mean, I'd say that because it'll have that negative real return. The real risk, you'll experience more inflation. Right now, a lot of it is in cash and there'll be a lot more money being produced. And But you'll experience that more in that kind of inflation. Things will go up. You could see inflation in houses, inflation in, you know, many things is going up. And then you'll start to see probably some labor inflation. If you start to see labor inflation and so on, it's will be a different kind of inflation, though. Because we're in a uh, more digital society, 
those things can be produced. That supply of digitalization can be produced without the capacity constraint. But the big monetary inflation is the thing. Where do I store my wealth? Because what happens to the markets is then when you go to those other things, let's say you go to stocks, you go to real estate, you go to other things because they're getting out of that. As those prices rise, like a bond, their future expected returns go down. And as they come closer to the interest rate, so now you've got whatever the interest rates are, it depends on the country, but it comes down, then there's no longer the incentive to buy those things and you could have trouble. And it becomes very difficult to tighten monetary policy because the whole thing falls apart. You know, everything's interest rate sensitive. And so the central bank has got to then print that. Then you have negative real returns in stocks and other assets like we did in the 70s, but the nominal return goes up. That pattern has happened over and over. I'm just trying to describe the mechanics of it. But there'll be some things that are broken for a long time, and then there's some things that are profoundly changed.